so we move on to the next speaker. Uh, so, um, Paxson Freddy, so please share your screen, Paxson. And I'm muting myself. Okay, can you guys see it? Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm Pax and Frady. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Evgeny, for you know organizing this workshop and uh, <laughs> turning it around into a great webinar uh, given the circumstances. Um, um, so I'm I'm going to tell you a lot about um, what we've been doing at the the Redwood Center at UC Berkeley uh, when with with these factor symbolic architecture ideas. Uh, we have this new paper about resonator networks uh, that we just put on archive um, <clears throat> last week. So I, um, I'm going to go through those. There's two of them actually, but, so I'm going to go through those papers, uh, but also check them out uh, uh, online. And um, and then um, I'm also currently a, a researcher in residence at Intel. And at Intel, we are working um, on some neuromorphic hardware. And I'm going to tell you about how we're trying to use vector symbolic architecture ideas to enable um, new and exciting algorithms uh, in, an, in neuromorphic hardware. <clears throat> so Intel makes me put uh, <laughs> yeah, these legal uh, disclaimers, but I'm not really gonna be telling you about any type of publicly available hardware, but you know, just don't uh, sue Intel over, over this talk for some reason. <laughs> um, okay, but first like, a lot like what Tony was saying is, is um, you know, we have these deep neural network machines that um, that perform rather well at, at certain benchmark tasks. And and if we switch from language to vision, you know, the paradigm is typically to just show uh, an image to one of these networks and have it output, you know, a class label. Um, but I think to all of us, you know, if we look at an image like this there's far more going on in the scene than, than what's expressed by the label. And to me, uh, it feels like, you know, as much as these networks have shown good progress and um, sort of our state of the art that there's still like a lot missing from their understanding about, you know, the world or, and language or, or just vision. And, you know, mostly they're, they're sort of outputting these, uh, shortcuts to to solving these like simple problems and they don't really have a deep understanding about you know what's happening in these images and 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 so like to me you know what's going on in your brain is is just way more complicated than than can be captured by just this association between an image and a label and i think this paradigm is is sort of short-sighted and, and there's a lot more to intelligence than than just like these supervised learning problems. <laughs> and if we go to vision, I think, you know, there was some older ideas about, you know, what computer vision should be like and um, what sort of the issues would be to, to have computer vision. And one of the things we have in computers is computer graphics, right? So we can, you know, look at any modern video game and the, the graphics are incredibly realistic. And so, it's, it's quite easy for us to express, you know, objects in a three-dimensional world and then generate um, an image of, of that world to show to people. But what the challenge is, is, is doing the inverse of this problem, is uh, taking the image and kind of inferring backwards the parameters uh, that make up the objects that consist in the world. And, and so this, this, this is challenging for, you know, even if you had like a very simple graphical model, it's still challenging to um, inverse this process. And you know, this is sort of like one of the problems uh, computationally that the brain would need to solve uh, to, to do vision. It's like as if, you know, we have some sort of generative graphical model in our minds and we need to infer uh, the parameters of this model um, uh, when given the, the input image. And, and so this sort of like inverse, uh, problem is uh, at the heart about this new algorithm, and we hope that um, you know by recognizing other these other problems besides just you know supervised learning and classification that you know the, the VSAs can really enable neural networks to do to do more things. 
And, uh, and so the, the main idea of this problem uh, is this idea of factorization. And, and it's clearly um, a very important aspect of perception. Um, because naturally, um, like in a stimulus like this, there is uh, a multiplication of several factors. And the, the perceptual system must be able to undo this multiplic multiplicative interaction to infer uh, properties of the scene. And so if you take a just a very simple object like this, um, <clears throat> the, the object is, is composed of some three-dimensional shape. Uh, the, the shape has different reflectance properties. And then there's like a lighting source, right? And so the exact uh, luminance that hits your eyes from, from different pixels in this image uh, is a multiplication of the lighting angle, the reflectance, and the, the, the angle of the the plane of the shape. And so all of these things are multiplied together and then the goal of your brain is to demultiply them. And, and because you can like see that actually um, there's some illusions that result from this inference process. And uh, for, for instance, in this like particular example, the, if you ask someone, you know, what is brighter, this R or this P, uh, well, typically they'll tell you the R, right? Because what they're, uh, um, basing their opinion on is the reflectance property of the object. But the reality is that because of the multiplication, uh, the actual pixel values uh, between P and R are the same luminance, right? And so, so you, you get this reflectance because you factorize out sort of the, the, the uh, impact that the lighting has on, on the brightness. And, and so perceptually you've uh, solved this sort of factorization problem. <laughs> So I was really attracted to VSAs and just come study VSAs because they they recognize that you know there's there's some missing ingredients to distributed representations and, and computations and the proposal of the binding operation and being able to form data structures with you know vectors and vector operations was crucial I think to making progress into enabling new algorithms in neural networks and and so. Um, in particular, in this talk, I'm going to be mostly focused on uh, just the bipolar version of the VSA. So essentially, you pick vectors for symbolic expressions by picking random high dimensional vectors. In this case, they're just minus ones and plus ones. You know, we store these symbolic vectors in a code book. Uh, then we have operations like dot product for similarity, uh, summations for forming a set, and then element wise multiply. In this case, it's a binding operation. And then we'll also be using permutations as well. Um, and so we, we kind of showed in, in another paper that uh, these, there's a lot of different varieties of VSAs, um, but they all rely on the same types of geometrical principles. And if you think about just like the geometry of vectors in high dimensional space, most of the VSAs are actually performing similar types of uh, manipulations. And, and so that's kind of why they've coalesced into this super class of vector symbolic architectures, even though there's uh, lots of different flavors of the particulars. Um, and so one thing you can do with VSAs is, is use these different operations to represent uh, different types of data structures. And so like in language, you might think about a parse tree. Um, and so how would you actually represent it? like a tree-like data structure with, with these vector um, architectures? And, and so here is just like a really basic, you know, abstract tree data structure. And the idea is that there's um, just different letters we want to assign to different leaves on the trees, uh, but then their location in the tree is encoded by this, these uh, special vectors left and right. And, and by conforming, forming these conjunctions of, of left and right and using the binding operation and the permutation operation, we can fully express um, where and what is in this tree in a single vector. <clears throat> so, um, so here we just have you know, the vector for that represents A attached to left, permute left, and permute twice left. And so each of the permutations just indicates like kind of a depth down the tree. And then the vector left or right indicates, you know, whether you take a left or right turn down the tree. And so then you can query this data structure by um, 
taking a particular location, so say like we want to know what, what element is at left, right, left down the tree, we can unbind this in the, in the bipolar form of VSA, the unbinding and binding are, are actually the same. So, but, but, but basically we unbind the um, address of the location in the tree. And what we're left over with is the vector B kind of exposed and all the other terms in the sum are act like noise. And uh, importantly, we, we have to then take this output vector and what we do is compare it to all the other vectors in the code book, in this case, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> and then by doing this uh, similarity comparison, we can look at like which, which of these vectors are, are the most similar. And, um, and that is the uh, output of the uh, computation. And so that's how we can find what items at a particular location in the tree. <clears throat> okay, but then, um, we realized that when manipulating these VSA structures and when you have these bindings, there ends up being um, a factorization problem that emerges all the time. And, and so you can see this in a tree example by kind of doing the opposite manipulation of a tree. So instead of asking, you know, what's in this location, we're asking where in the tree is this particular item? So this is the problem with tree search. Um, and so again, like what we can do is just is just unbind uh, the, the the node we're interested in, and and what that does is it exposes this location, right? But the the issue here is that um, we still need to do some sort of comparison to really understand what this vector means. And naively, what we would have to do is compare this um, exposed location to every possible path that could um, exist in the tree. And so we now like run into this combinatorics problem where uh, to actually solve this problem, we would have to express the combinatorically large number of paths down the tree to find the most similar path that this, this computation results in. Um, and so this is uh, you know, something I think that has limited the application of VSAs to more complicated problems because this, this combinatorics problem arises quite often and um, and so abstractly, um, we can see it sort of just from this very basic um, problem. So the idea is um, we have some binding of multiple factors. And uh, so here I'm showing three, but it could be two, it could be however many, like some number of products bound together. And, and what we're given is sort of the result of the binding. So we know we have the S, but we don't know X, Y, or Z. And um, but we do know that they, they, the X, Y, and Z come from a, a set. Like, so we do have these code books and we, we can narrow down the X, Y, and Z to, to some of these possibilities. But the typical approach to like, um, trying to understand what S is com composed of would be to, to search through every possible combination of X, Y, and Z. So if, if these D values were say like 100, so there's 100 possible Xs, 100 possible Ys, 100 possible Zs, well, the combinatorics of that is 100 times 100 times 100, which is a million, right? So we'd have to search through a million possible combinations to understand what this uh, S variable is made out of. And so this, this becomes untenable because we have this, we don't want this combinatorics explosion. Um, so we kind of stumbled upon this, this way of solving the problem, which doesn't really require you to express the full combinatorics of these sort of factorizations. And this is, um, a neural network that we like to call the resonator network. And, and the idea is that we are going to use this principle of superposition in VSAs to actually search through this combinatoric space um, without like actually explicitly um, representing every possible combination. <clears throat> okay, so then the way this works is, is we, we start off by creating some vectors that are, are guesses or estimates of, of each of the factors. And, and then, um, we can initialize the guess to be the superposition of all possibilities. And, and then um, we can take uh, two of the guesses and unbind them from the input vector and, and, and use that to infer the, uh, the third factor, right? Um, so if, if, if we knew exactly what X and Y were, this would like give us exactly what the third factor is. Um, but then when we do this estimate and superposition, what we have is like many guesses being tested at once. Um, and, um, but then the result of this sort of 
un unconfidence unbinding uh, leads to a bunch of cross, what we call crosstalk noise. And so, so when we try to infer, I guess, with lots of superpositions, uh, the result ends up in a lot of crosstalk noise. Um, but then uh, in the next part of this algorithm, what we can do is we can take the results of this guess and, and pipe it through these, these code books and, and through like what we would call a cleanup memory. And, and so essentially, uh, we're going to just limit the vector z to be one of these vectors in the code bug by like projecting it um, onto the span of z. And so what this does is sort of cleans up um, the guess from uh, x and y and, and results in a slightly better guess for z. Okay, And now we take this slightly better guess for z and we use it in, to infer one of the other factors. And, and um, we just keep iterating on this process of uh, putting a bunch of guesses in superposition, taking, doing a noisy inference of, of the factor and then cleaning up the inference. And, and, and this then like kind of couples into a dynamical system that sort of looks like this and in, into a current neural network where we sort of have something that looks like a, a hot field network with these outer product learning rule. Uh, but, but, in, but said there's several of them running uh, in parallel and they're all kind of coupled through this binding operation. Okay, and so then um, by designing uh, the, this, this resonator network the right way, we can um, actually solve this tree search problem. And so um, what we're gonna do is, is encode in these, um, these code books, actually the vector left, the vector right, and then a special vector, which is the identity vector actually, that means uh, stop. And, and then we can um, type in a, um, this structured re representation of the, the location in the tree through this resonator network. And it will search through all the possible paths uh, of a tree to find the path of this particular letter. And, and what it looks like is sort of like this crazy chaotic jumping around um, for a few iterations until suddenly there's sort of like this moment of insight where it, it hones in on the right uh, factorization of the problem and, and everything kind of simultaneously converges. Um, so if you try to find the A, you know, you unbind A from that tree I showed earlier, its path will be exposed. You put this into the resonator network, you know, so then what you're seeing here is, is the dynamics of the resonator network happening over time. So, so the first few iterations, it jumps around, it changes pretty drastically every iteration until finally around iteration nine or 10 in this case, it hones in on the particular location that, that makes sense. And, and then everything becomes uh, stable after that. And so you can see different examples um, of different letters. So sometimes it takes more, more time to, and it depends on how many, um, you know, uh, uh, neurons are in these vectors and it depends on how many, you know, objects are in the tree and, and things like that. Um, but essentially this is like the gist is that it, it's sort of randomly searching through all of this combinatoric space until it finds uh, the answer. <clears throat> and so in the paper, we also have um, actually an example of, of this applying to a very simple scene. It's, it's much along the lines of a scene like this where there's just certain letters and certain locations. Um, in the paper, we actually have um, a deep network learning to map um, a, a scene like this into the vector and then we factorize it. But more recently, we've been able to, to solve this sort of scene analysis problem without any type of learning. And um, again, you can just sort of see here just the dynamics of the resonator and what it does when there's multiple objects. And so uh, what happens is it will um, randomly essentially hone in on a particular object, solve its factorization, what letter, what color, what location, and then um, it'll become stable. And then what, what we do next is uh, once it's stable, we can uh, explain away this particular object. And so we kind of take the output of the resonator, explain that away from the scene and restart the whole system. And then it will hone in on a different letter. And so you can then like pr propose these, that these like visual problems, these scene analysis problems have this like as aspect of factorization. And if you can set up the problem um, in a certain way, then uh, you can use this resonator network algorithm to um, factorize the scene. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then in the second part of the paper, or the second paper, um, we 
we do a very in-depth analysis on um, the performance of the resonator network compared to just like some standard optimization methods. And, and basically um, what we see is, is, is that it works like remarkably well. So um, uh, we try to explain a little bit why is it better. And part of the intuition is that the resonator network actually does not have um, what we call a Lyapunov function, meaning like it doesn't follow a, a gradient like almost every optimization method. So most optimization, they define a cost function and we follow a gradient to a local minima. But we show that th th this isn't the case in the resonator network and there's much more, there's no like Lyapunov function and, and, and for some reason that, that it gives, us, gives it um, an a, ability to explore the state space better. Um, and then in general, what we find is that even though there's no Lyapunov function, uh, we can show that empirically, it's almost always um, going to converge um, and to the right answer, given that it's under its, what we call its operational capacity. So we found this relationship between um, whether it solves a problem um, based on how uh, big is the problem, meaning how many combinations are, are you trying to search over, and um, and how many neurons are in this network. So, so as we scale up the, the VSA networks, we can solve larger and larger problems. And if, if uh, the problem is smaller than the, the network's operational capacity, um, then it will converge um, almost all the time. <clears throat> and then as you get out here, it, it sort of goes into this regime where it just never converges. It sort of bounces around chaotically for forever. Um, and then as you increase further, eventually it starts to just converge to a bad local minima. Just it starts to um, converge to the wrong answer. So you know, so this is like just a very beginning um, start to like try to use these algorithms for visual problems. And I just wanted to like kind of point to just you know thinking about the brain and um, you know how there's so this like big um, push in the field to compare like the, the layers of a hierarchical deep network to you know, the hierarchy and cortex, but it's sort of unnatural. And I think that the, the resonator network actually has a sort of hierarchical feel to it that, you know, kind of corresponds more and more to like what would happen in the brain. Or, or like, if you try to extend this sort of basic work from this two-dimensional simple shapes type of visual and and they would end up having a sort of hierarchy the way they arrange and the way they would talk to each other. Um, and so I'm like very excited to think about how this factorization approach can help us understand like what all these different brain regions are, are doing. Um, so, okay, so I, I figured out that I wouldn't have enough time to like really get through everything, but um, I'm also like working very closely with Intel to um, help flesh out this neuromorphic computing device. And so we have essentially a piece of hardware that simulates integrating fire neurons. And uh, a lot of our research is, has been devoted to trying to figure out VSA principles that we can, can use to make this hardware work. And so we've been developing a, a VSA that, that's sort of compatible with uh, spikes and uh, neuromorphic hardware. And sort of the first um, step towards uh, making a BSA that works with spikes is to um, is is presented in this recent paper we had come out last year about um, the relationship between uh, complex variables and spike timing codes and and so there is a a couple of complex valued variations of BSAs and what we realized is that you can um, interpret complex neural states as, as spike timing codes. And so the idea is if a neuron is a complex value, uh, the phase of that complex number can be expressed by the timing of a spike relative to an oscillation. But what, what, hap what the consequence of, of complex valued neurons are is that there's also complex valued synaptic connections. And in the previous work that this part wasn't really considering, this really was the insight. It's like, how do you make a complex valued synaptic connection? And um, and so what we realize is actually that all this means is a synaptic delay. So, so the phase of a synapse, if it's complex valued, is actually um, a synaptic delay. And then by putting together um, these ideas about spike timing and synaptic delays, we can make um, a neural network that 
operates on complex numbers, does complex matrix algebra, but with spikes and spike timing codes. And so, so essentially you sort of, you need this like oscillatory mechanism. So there's some sort of oscillation that gets defined that helps you understand what the phases are. And so to do this, we have just like a simple recurrent uh, loop of, of inhibition, excitation and inhibition. And then um, by changing the delays and the spike timing patterns, you can get like coherent or decoherent activations of your neurons. And so, and so if, if the phases and, and the spike timing patterns aren't, uh, the synaptic delays and the spike timing patterns aren't uh, commensurate, then you know, the spikes arrive at different times, they sort of like don't really add up and they just get canceled out to, to, not, to not cause any spikes in the postsynaptic neuron. <laughs> but if they're like in alignment, then you get these big oscillations and then these big oscillations cause spikes at particular times. And, and through this, you can actually implement all the complex matrix algebra. And, and in, in this case, we, um, we just implement a simple attractor network. And this is like part of the cleanup memory often used in, in vector symbolic architectures. So, so here's just like a network kind of initialized to um, some overlapping patterns. And then over time, it cleans itself up to converge to one of the particular patterns. And, uh, um, and so this is just like a visualization of that. Um, yeah, and finally, we were, you know, what's also important is sparsity. And so we've also been developing um, a VSA that relies on uh, sparse, uh, that uses sparse connections. So the, every, most of the VSAs are dense, meaning that every neuron is active all the time, but in spiking hardware, we want, um, you know, only a few neurons to be active and that saves us a lot of energy. And so we kind of like did, made this other paper that's coming out soon that that really like analyzes what the binding operation means and how it's related to the outer product. And we per, we examined a bunch of um, sparse binding operations and um, and essentially to 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 make the story short is that uh, we we've kind of settled on this idea of a block code. So so essentially. Um, you have, in, you have these sparse vectors where only one neuron is active in each block. And so you might have K blocks. And, and then by binding, you do, um, to bind, you do circular convolution of block by block. And this actually uh, is perfectly invertible and it uh, saves you a lot uh, in neural resources. Um, so this paper will be coming out soon. Uh, sorry to like gloss over it, but. Um, this is, I just want to give you like the highlights of what we've been doing and, and where we're going. And, um, and so here's just like a, a list of, of these papers. Uh, so check them out if you want to know more. Um, and this new sparse binding paper will be coming out um, hopefully like this week. It's very close. And then, so I just want to thank everyone from the Redwood Center, um, uh, you know, Bruno and Spencer were a big part of the Resonator Network and uh, of course Fritz. And, uh, and uh, Mike Davies and Intel for um, sponsoring me. All right, thank you very much, Paxson. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, we have some some minutes for questions, uh, comments, if any. So please enable your mics and speak. Uh, hi. Um, one of the really cool things about uh, VSA is that um, from the hardware point of view, a vector is just a vector, whether it's representing something atomic or something really complex and compositional. Right. So I was just wondering whether in your um, uh, resonator circuit, whether you had tried uh, stocking your cleanup memories with uh, vectors corresponding to more complex fragments. So for example, in your tree example, uh, I, it looked like you're just using atomic left and right and so on as your uh, cleanup. But perhaps if you yeah. had uh, path fragments like left, right, left as uh, as a cleanup uh, item. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can do that. Um, it sort of uh, depends on what you want to do. Uh, as another example, um, the, the actual, oh. uh, in this template matching example, um, what I actually store in these code books are um, more complicated, simple, symbolic vectors. Um, so in fact, to deal with um, the correlations between these like template letters, you have to sort of um, compute some decorrelations or do some whitening. And so you actually get these uh, like widened uh, shapes. And effectively, I'm 
storing in the code book, not symbolic vectors per se, but, but actually um, uh, there, there are these, these whitened shapes put into the vector space. And, and so, yeah, so there's definitely more complicated things you can put into the code books and like designing the code books is a big aspect of like how to design and solve certain problems. Um, but then, you know, there are certain things you need to make sure of like, that the, the, the correlations of the code books, uh, that if you want the vec you need the vectors to essentially be orthogonal or else it's gonna sort of overemphasize certain directions and, and there's sort of a balance you have to capture, but, but yes, you can um, store much more complicated things than just symbolic vectors. So how, how do you represent, uh, or how do you deal with rotational invariants for these uh, characters? Have you looked at that? <laughs> Yeah, that's something we're uh, still trying to figure out. And um, there's this other trick to, that I used to just do translation and it has to do with exponentiating actually these vectors. And, and this, it, I didn't have time to go into all of this, but, but we're using things in the complex domain. And so um, you can actually raise the vector to an exponent um, and, and use that to represent location. And then these vectors will distribute. So, so it's sort of a, a this like kind of nice trick to encode translation. And to deal with rotation and scaling, we've been thinking about it a lot. And um, one possibility is actually to, um, you know, the idea would be like um, attached to this box of digit would be two extra boxes, which would be sort of like the digit invariant to rotation and the rotation it's actually currently, you know, using. Um, and and one one way to like, propose that problem is actually to do uh, a log polar transform. So if we could take this box and sort of project it as a log polar into a new coordinate system, then, um, then we can like propose like a similar factorization in this new coordinate system that would account for uh, rotation and scaling in fact. And so this is something we're actually uh, working on now. Any more questions? Amounts. Yeah, back then. So with the with the neuromorphic chips, what's mm -hmm. the what's the motivation for using um, spike timing as the you know rather than a you know more conventional digital zero one or or whatever? Is it is it efficiency or is it to model um, what we know about real neurons or what? Well, originally we were you know just thinking about the brain and how there's oscillations and spike timing. Um, but then in the chip actually, um, the, the performance of the chip does depend very, very much so on how many spikes you are communicating in any given time step. And by utilizing this sort of spike timing code, you, we are, we're, we're also sparsifying the spikes in time. And so we get benefits from the hardware by just minimizing the amount of, of spikes we have to broadcast kind of every time step. And, and so by utilizing the spike timing code, we're thinking that like, yeah, we can, you know, do more by yeah, spreading the spikes around in time and like lowering congestion um, on, the, on, on the hardware. Right. All right. Uh, looks like our time is up. So thank you very much to both presenters. Uh, excellent talks, lots of um, ideas to think about. Uh, I want to remind everybody about our uh, VSA related mailing list. So if you have any additional questions, so please uh, um, post them there. Uh, as well as, um, uh, yeah, if you have any related to VSA HD question, uh, question or topic, so please post it th there as well. Uh, so for now, we've, we end this webinar, and I want to remind you that we have one more webinar in two weeks. So please come and listen. Thank you very much. Goodbye.